Perform hand hygiene and apply appropriate PPE before entering the patient's room. Introduce yourself and ask for your patient's full name and date of birth. If in a hospital setting, verify the accuracy of this information with the patient's ID bracelet. If in a home or clinic setting, make sure the patient's info matches previous documentation or a Medicare card. Explain to the patient what you will be doing. In this case, I'll explain to my patient that I'm here to perform a postpartum assessment. I will let them know that my assessment includes touching the breast area, touching the abdomen, legs, and checking their pad. Always let your patient know that they have the right to refuse at any point and ask for their consent to continue. Make sure you have gathered all the relevant information needed before starting any physical assessment. In this case, I would have already done either a full health history or focused postpartum history, as well as performed a PQRST IUA. All physical assessments must be done directly on the skin, whether you are inspecting, palpating, or auscultating. It is never to be done over clothing. I will make sure my patient has time to go to the bathroom if they feel the need to go before the exam. I will ask my patient to lie in bed and make sure they are comfortable. The head of the bed must be flat once I examine the abdominal area. I will raise the height of the bed so that I'm comfortable and not hurting my back. In the bubble E assessment, each letter stands for a different part of the assessment. You should be assessing the breast, uterus, bowels, bladder, lochia, legs, episiotomy, which includes any type of laceration, including that from a C-section, and the emotional state of the mother. It is best to assess the bowels before the bladder or uterus as we need to auscultate. I will ask my patient to remove the top part of the gown and ensure I have permission to palpate the breasts. You should apply gloves if you feel like you will come into contact with bodily fluid. The breasts appear symmetrical and are even in skin color throughout. There is no redness present and no signs of infection. I will examine whether the nipples are inverted, erect, or flat. If my patient plans to breastfeed, they may have more difficulty with inverted or flat nipples. Therefore, my patient may want extra teaching or an appointment with a lactation consultant to help with breastfeeding. In this case, my patient's nipples are erect, the skin around the nipples are intact and not cracked. Before palpating, I will make sure to ask my patient if the breasts are sore at all. I will ask my patient to let me know if there is any tenderness upon palpation. I will palpate both breasts starting near the center and working my way outwards in a circular motion. Remember to palpate everywhere, including into the axilla. I am not feeling any lumps, nodules, or masses. I am also checking whether the breasts feel soft or firm. The breasts are usually soft one to two days postpartum and then become more firm on days three to four before they begin to soften again. Throughout the palpation, my patient denied any tenderness. I will cover my patient as soon as I'm done to provide privacy. Next, I will assess the bowels. If your patient has been urinating regularly since delivery, you should make sure they go before you start the assessment. I will ensure that my patient is flat in bed while assessing the bowels, as well as when I assess the bladder and uterus later on. First, I will ask my patient what their usual elimination pattern is. It is different for everyone, but I want to make sure my patient is close to their baseline. I will ask to see if any laxatives were used during pregnancy and see if they continued using them postpartum. I will ask my patient if they recall their last bowel movement. If they delivered that same day, it could be two to three days before their next bowel movement. If they have not yet had one since delivery, I can ask if they have been passing gas. Later in the assessment, we will ask about pain in the perineal area. Sometimes a patient may fear going to the washroom because of the pain it may cause. I will make sure to auscultate the bowel sounds with the diaphragm of my stethoscope in all four quadrants, starting in the right lower quadrant and moving clockwise.
I hear five to 30 bowel sounds a minute, which is normal. Next, I will assess the bladder. I will ask my patient if she has urinated since delivery, and if yes, when was the last time? If my patient had an epidural, I want to ensure that she does not have any urinary retention. She should be voiding within six to eight hours after delivery. I will ask my patient if they have any pain while urinating or dysuria. I will ask if they have any increased frequency or urgency to urinate and if they have noticed any foul odor. These are all signs of a urinary tract infection. UTIs take time to develop, so this would not be present if the patient has recently given birth, but rather a few days to a week afterwards. Either way, you should be asking these questions as the patient may also feel a burning due to lacerations. I will ask about the color of the urine, which should be a clear yellow. Lastly, I will palpate the bladder for possible distension. If the patient has just voided, it should not be palpable. Ensuring that my patient is still supine, I will assess the uterus. After the delivery, the uterus immediately starts to shrink back down to its original size, decreasing in height about one to two centimeters a day. I will place one hand at the symphysis pubis and another hand above the umbilicus. I will work my way down until I feel a bump, which is the fundus, which is the top of the uterus. Within the first 24 hours postpartum, the fundus should be at the level of the umbilicus, known as U over U. If it were one centimeter above, it would be one over U. If it were two centimeters below, it would be U over two. The fundus should be midline and not deviated to the right or left, which could indicate a distended bladder. The fundus should feel firm to touch and not boggy. If the fundus felt boggy and was in a higher position than expected, this could indicate uterine atony. One nursing intervention to help with this includes a fundal massage. Next, I will assess the lochia, the vaginal discharge. Ensure gloves are applied as you will come into contact with bodily fluid. I will ask my patient to show me their pad and ask them when is the last time they changed it and how often they are changing it. I will note the color. In this case, the lochia is rubra, a dark red, which is normal within the first one to two days postpartum. You also want to note the amount of lochia on the pad, which will be identified as scant, light, moderate, or heavy. In this case, my patient's lochia is a moderate amount. Heavy is when a pad is saturated within two hours, which would be concerning. Serosa color is a brownish, red, or pink, which is normal within four to 10 days postpartum. Alba is a yellowish white, which is seen after 10 days postpartum. You always want to make sure that the color is progressing towards a lighter color. Note that each brand of pad absorbs differently. I also want to make sure to turn my patient on the side to make sure there's no lochia leaking and pooling under the sheets. I will also ask the patient if she has noticed any foul odor or if it resembles the normal menses smell. Foul odor may indicate infection. You want to encourage your patient to change their pad every time they go to the bathroom to help prevent infection. I will also note or ask my patient if any blood clots were observed. Blood clots are normal, but we would be concerned if they were larger than the size of a golf ball. What looks like a large blood clot may actually be part of the placenta. If you are ever unsure, a good way to tell the difference is by rubbing the clot or run it under water. If it dissolves, then it is a clot. If it stays solid, then it may be placenta. It is important to educate your patient to look out for this as they will have lochia for quite a few weeks postpartum. If my patient had a C-section, I would check the incision site for any swelling, redness, drainage, or discharge. I would ensure that the edges of the incision are well approximated and that the sutures are intact. I will now check the perineal area for any natural tears or if an episiotomy was done. It is best for my patient to be turned to the side so I can see the whole area. I see minimal swelling and redness, which is normal for a fresh laceration. There is no drainage present. The edges are well approximated. If there were sutures, I would ensure that they were well intact. I will ask my patient if they have any pain in the area and also palpate for any discomfort. Lastly, I will check the rectal area for hemorrhoids. I will note the color and the amount of hemorrhoids present. In this case, the hemorrhoids are a dark red color and there are five hemorrhoids present. As I've just touched the pad and perineal area, I will remove my gloves and wash my hands. Next, I will assess the legs.
No redness is noted on the legs. My patient denies tenderness while I palpate. Skin temperature is even bilaterally and warm to touch. No pitting edema is present. It can be normal for the mother to have some edema, but should be minimal and should improve with time. If my patient had a tender area that was red, hot to touch with pitting edema, I would be concerned about a possible deep vein thrombosis. I also want to address my patient's emotional state. I will ask my patient about their general mood and if they are experiencing fatigue. It's normal for the new mom to feel tired right after labor, but they should still be able to care for themselves and their baby and be generally happy. As patients are not hospitalized for long after delivery, it's important to educate as much as you can throughout your assessment about abnormal findings and what the new mom should be looking out for. For example, monitoring the color and amount of lochia, or monitoring for signs of a urinary tract infection. I also want to make sure to educate my patient about the postpartum blues. The baby blues is a normal occurrence and brings feelings of sadness or tearfulness within three to 14 days postpartum, but will go away by the second or third week. If symptoms worsen, such as the mom being unable to care for herself or the infant, or feeling disinterested by the infant, this could be postpartum depression. Let the mom know that if symptoms of the baby blues are worsening or lasting longer than three weeks, then it is most likely postpartum depression and she needs to seek help immediately. After completing your health history and physical assessment, you will be able to identify your nursing care priority, provide relevant teaching and nursing interventions to help the patient with their situation. You should also be able to identify strengths and challenges from the information gathered. Include follow-up instructions that demonstrate a collaborative approach with the patient. You want to make sure that you and your patient have an equal understanding of the next steps. Make sure to thank your patient and ask them if they have any questions. Ensure they are comfortable and have the call bell in place if in a hospital setting. Also make sure to bring the bed back to the lowest position. If in a hospital setting, you may put the bed rails back up as well if your patient requires it. Make sure to wash your hands after having been in contact with your patient and their environment.